Today on Perpetual Projects, we continue to try to get our 66 Fury running properly. We're gonna go over 10 things that you should check on your ignition system if you have a classic car with points ignition. So in no particular order other than it was convenient to film it this way because we're sitting at the bench and we have the distributor out of our car, we're gonna start with one of the things that I don't hear people talk about very often and we're gonna check and make sure that our vacuum advance unit is working uh, two reasons. It can cause a vacuum leak that can cause other problems and if it's not working, well, you don't have vacuum advance and you're not getting the benefit of it. What we're gonna use to check our vacuum advance is just the Mighty Vac vacuum tool. We're gonna install it on our distributor, just on the vacuum advance pod and then we're gonna watch our distributor as I pump this and we should be able to see the plate that the points are hooked to move. I think it's moving but from my angle it's kinda of hard to tell but we can definitely tell if we let the vacuum off. As you can see, that plate is moving the way that it's supposed to and we know that our vacuum advance is also holding a vacuum. If we look at our gauge, it's holding right around 15 pounds and that's probably all I pumped into it. So that's our first check. The vacuum advance is working the way it's supposed to. The way you'll know that your vacuum pot is no good is if one, when you put a vacuum on it, it doesn't move, or if two, it doesn't hold pressure. That means the diaphragm in here is wasted, and this is gonna be a vacuum leak that could be the reason that you are troubleshooting all this because your uh, vacuum pot is creating a massive vacuum leak that you didn't know you had. We're gonna call this step 1A. It's still advanced, but that was vacuum. This is mechanical, and it does the same thing in a different way. So, as you can see, there's weights in here. And I'm gonna clamp this in the vise so you can see it move easier. Because now, as I spin this, this doesn't move. I'm gonna put the rotor on there because it also will allow you to see it a little better. And as I move these weights out, you're gonna see that, motor, that rotor move. As long as it's moving free, for the purpose of this video, that's all we're looking for. There is things you can do with changing the weight of the springs and changing the advance curve but that's beyond the scope of this video. The second thing that we're gonna check in our distributor are the points. And it's this piece right here. Uh, I have a set out, it's easier to see. What these do is they have this rubbing block that rubs on the cam on the distributor and as this goes around, when it's time, they break the gap, and this is exaggerated, right there, <clears throat> and that causes the coil to fire and light the mixture in whatever cylinder everything's pointing to. So what we're looking for on our points is this rubbing block here needs to be there one and not worn completely down. And then the contactor here needs to be nice and clean and not pitted. And I'm just gonna take a little emery cloth, put it in there, clean them up. And then I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it or not, but they're nice and shiny now. I'll try to hold these up and they're a nice clean contact point. Whenever you're checking your points, if you clean them like I did, you need to make sure you reset the gap. And to do that, I'm just using a 17 thousandths feeler gauge. That's what this calls for. You gotta get them to the maximum opening. It's much easier to do this in the car because you can use the engine to hold all this and I'm having to hold it by my, myself. And then you just want the feeler gauge to drop in there and it, should, it shouldn't move the points when you put it in there. It should go in nice and free, but it still should be touching. It shouldn't flop around in there. And the last part of maintenancing your points is gonna be putting a little bit of some type of lubricant on the, uh, the cam, the distributor cam there. I found that it was okay to use dielectric grease, not saying that's the case, but that's what I'm gonna use. The third thing that we're gonna check is the condenser and it's located inside the distributor right here and it, it's this round looking piece. And it's not always inside the distributor. On some distributor it's actually mounted on the outside so you'll just have to look for it and find it. So the way we're gonna test this is with our multimeter and we're gonna set it to ohms and then this multimeter defaults to a continuity check and you can tell that by the little arc, it's like a, it signifies that it's gonna make a noise, it's gonna beep when there's continuity. We need to change that to regular ohms mode and then we need to change our range from auto to mega ohms. Then, 
we're gonna connect our black wire to the wire and touch the case with our red wire, our red lead, and you're gonna see the ohms start out low and then they're gonna climb all the way to OL, which is out of limit. That means it's, it's open, basically. And that means that this condenser is working the way it's supposed to. It's basically a capacitor and now it's charged. Now I wanna show you something. If you have one that's not connected to the distributor, which if it's connected to the distributor, as long as the points close, it will discharge it. But now we've charged this one. As soon as we put our meter on it, it's gonna go straight to OL. It's not gonna show everything because this is holding an electrical charge. And the way we're gonna get rid of that, and another way to check it is if it's charged, you can go to voltage and put your voltmeter on here and you should see it jump up voltage and it'll slowly go down to zero. Just like that. And now we can go back and if we wanted to, we could do our ohms test again. But I wanna show you one other thing because this is a fancy, expensive multimeter that I have. And I wasn't planning on using this, but in order to get the test to show you exactly the way it's supposed to show you, I had to use this one because my little cheap one that I use all the time isn't fast enough, actually it's probably fast enough, it doesn't have an ohm setting, it only has a continuity test. And you can measure resistance with that test, like it'll show you resistance, but it won't do the test for this, it just stays at OL. I don't know if it's not fast enough, or if it's reading too high of resistance, I'm not sure why it doesn't work, but I do know that with this one, Remember, we discharged it, so we, it's not holding a charge. We can get it to go and show us it having voltage and dropping that voltage. If we go to the volt setting and then put it on there, you can see it started out at one volt and dropped down to zero. And then we can put this back to the continuity test and just hold it on here. It doesn't take too long. Just give it a few seconds to charge and then we should be able to go back to our volt setting and we should be able to see it start out and then discharge. And then if we wait a minute, we can see that it now doesn't have any charge in it. So we know this condenser is working the way it's supposed to. If you get one that is shorted or you can't get anything out of it, then it probably needs to be replaced. But if you can get that, it's really easy to see this with an uh, analog multimeter, but I don't have one. And I like using my little cheap one, but uh, it wouldn't show the result the way that it really needed to be. The fourth thing we're gonna check on our ignition system is the cap and rotor. This is the rotor, this is the cap. And unfortunately, I don't have a bad example to show you, but what you're looking for is on your contact points inside the distributor cap here, and on the spring in the tip of your rotor, you're looking for arcing. And I have an example of what that looks like, kind of. If you can see right there, that's an arc, I just arced this on a battery, and you'll see that on the end of your rotor. And as it gets worse and worse, you'll, you can actually see this will burn away. And if it looks rough and gouged and pitted, probably time to replace it. This one looks pretty good. The fifth thing we're gonna check is our plug wires. And the first thing you wanna do is look them over visually, make sure there's no burn marks. I mean, these are a little discolored, but I think they'll be okay. Uh, also, look down inside the boots. I don't, you're not gonna be able to see it, but all of these should have the metal clip that hooks onto the plug in there. And then just to make sure that they're good, because we're not trying to spend a bunch of money we don't need to spend, I'm gonna go ahead and use my cheap multimeter again. I did verify that this does work on that continuity setting. It gives me the same resistance reading with that one or my better one. We're gonna take one end of your, it doesn't matter which end, and put it inside the boot and make sure you make good contact with that clip that holds the spark plug and go to the corresponding point on the distributor cap and not read volts, we're gonna read continuity or ohms. And you can see we have about 867 ohms on that wire. And I'm just gonna show you too, just to show you that these wires are pretty resistive and you can see that this one is not quite 50% longer than that one, like it's half again as long. And the resistance in these is measured by the foot, like you can probably look it up and find out what it's supposed to be. I don't really care. I'm looking for something that is not open or shorted or really low. This one is 
1367 ohms so it's about one and a half times what the shorter one was so i would say that these plug wires are in good shape i've checked them all they're all about in that range uh, i looked it up sae says anything below 15,000 i think 15,000 ohms per foot is considered good this is a performance set of excel plug wires um and they're less than that they're measuring out probably somewhere around 750 ohms per foot so the sixth thing that we're going to check is the coil. And this isn't the one from our car, it's one I had in my parts bucket over there. And we're gonna test it with the multimeter. I just wanna show you guys, this does have an ohms setting where you can select your range. So I could have tested the condenser with it. You have to be 10% smarter than the tools you're trying to use. So the first thing we're gonna check on our coil is the primary winding, which is the one between the two posts where you hook your wires, your ignition wires to. What we're looking for is between a half and four and a half ohms is kind of the range that I found online. And then on the secondary coil, which is between either one of these posts and the center post, we should have somewhere around nine, 9,500 kilo ohms. This one's a little bit higher than that. Um, I'd say it's probably still good. 10 and a half should be okay. We know the one on our car works because it was running, so we're not gonna bother checking that one. I just wanna show you guys how to check a coil with a multimeter. All right, onto the seventh thing we're gonna check. The seventh thing we're gonna check is the ballast resistor. And depending on what your car is, the readings are gonna be different. What you're looking for here is just to check and make sure that you have some resistance here. It should be not zero, and not open. So if it's that's 1.5 ohms, that's okay. That is out of limits. That means that it's open and it's not making connection. And if you're having no start condition, that's what it could be. So if it's shorted, it's gonna show very, very low resistance. That's showing 0.2 ohms of resistance, which means that you basically have a short. And while it might start that way, it's gonna be passing too much voltage to the coil and you could burn up the points or the coil. So you don't wanna run it that way. The eighth thing to check on your ignition is the spark plugs. And it seems kind of late in the list, but we checked a lot of other things that are more core to the ignition. And now, this is the spark plugs we took out. Um, some of them are a little wet. All of them are very dark, black, and sooty. Uh, the gap doesn't look terrible. What you'll see sometimes is there's, there'll be a lot of erosion on the electrode in here and on the ground strap. Um, these don't look terrible, but based on how wet and sooty they look, I'm guessing that a couple of these are fouled. And that can be caused from the engine running. Uh, I mean, this hasn't really ran, and it, the little bit we've run it has been with the choke on. And it never really has been out on the highway and, and been up to speed to really get the plugs hot enough to clean everything off. We're going to go ahead and stick a, stick a new set in and see if maybe that is the cause of the rough running, rough idle that we have. So... I like to use these wire gauges to set the gap on my plugs. I just feel like it's a little more accurate. Um, you can use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, if you are using these wire gauges, they should just slide in. You shouldn't have to put a bunch of pressure on it. I used to have a really nice set of these that had a little tool to bend them with. But if you're going to bend it, make sure you don't grab it where you're going to could crack that porcelain on the insulator there. And it doesn't take much to change the gap a whole bunch, as you can see. And then there's other tricks. And again, this, this isn't a video about all the nuances of getting the maximum power out of your plugs. This is about just getting your car running properly. I just, the, the, so what I'm doing there is that ground strap, I'm not sure if you guys can see that. It's kind of bent to the side a little bit, and it probably won't affect anything. I just feel like it should be centered over the... The center there so that's what i'm messing with once you have them gapped it's time to install them if you have a washer then you need to turn them a little bit further than if you have a tapered seat and just make sure that you do like for like if you took out plugs with the washer make sure you put in plugs with the washer back i turn them about a half a turn i don't know if that's proper but that's what i do the ninth thing that we're going to check is the dwell and we've already set the gap on the points and that should suffice, but if you have a 12 meter, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and check it. I'll be honest, I don't know if this one even works. It's been a long time since I used it, and uh, I had to fix the wires on it. They were all messed up where they came out. So we're gonna see if it still works, and if it does, we'll show you what it looks like. 
But basically all you're doing is on here, you've got different scales. You've got your eight cylinder RPM scale, your six cylinder RPM scale. And then down at the bottom, you've got your eight and six cylinder dwell scale. And we're gonna try to set our dwell, and I'm guessing, I haven't looked this up, but I'm thinking we want it somewhere around 30, um, 20, 26 to 30. And then this also has a setting for points, but it's so faded I can't really read what it says. It says okay and bad. We're gonna maybe we'll switch it over to points and see what happens. And this, this one just hooks up to the coil, positive on the positive side, negative on the negative side. All right, so our dwell meter works. It came in right at uh, about 29. So we're gonna leave it there. Uh, we got the car running good enough now that we highlighted another problem. The carburetor doesn't go back to idle for some reason. And uh, that's why it's running almost 1800 RPM. The tenth and final check we're gonna do is we're gonna set the timing. We're doing this last because one, everything can affect the timing and if you set the dwell after you set the timing you will change the timing because by ch changing the dwell effectively you're changing the gap in the points and then you change the opening time and that's going to affect the timing so this is the last step in getting our ignition system all tuned up i'm gonna go ahead and start it and set the timing I would say our ignition system is in good shape now. Got the timing set. I don't know if you can see that on the balancer, but just a tip for you, when you're working on this, if you just get a paint marker and mark the balancer and the zero mark, especially if you have one of these, one of these timing lights that you can adjust, uh, then it's a lot easier to see where your timing mark's at when you get ready to start timing it. But it definitely runs a lot smoother now. Uh, we do have some other problems that we've highlighted now by getting it to run properly. The idle is way too high. As you can see, the carburetor doesn't come all the way back to idle like it's supposed to. There's linkages missing. There's a linkage that's missing from the fast idle cam. And so we've got problems to address on the carburetor, but we're gonna save that for the next video. This is gonna conclude our video on tuning up your classic car ignition system. See you soon.